Robbie, let them in. Different slide. There we go. Back one. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back for the third um, event of the day. And I don't even know how many we did yesterday, but we've done a pile and we got a pile ahead of us. And it's uh, really a lot of fun. I'm learning a lot of interesting things. And you know what? I think I might try some bird journaling. That was really interesting, that last one with, uh, with Jack Laws. And you know what? I'm really looking forward to this one because I've never tried this bird recording thing. And I think that might be, um, might be something I'd like to give it a try. So uh, we are gonna be learning from uh, Dr. Norm Pillsbury here in just a minute about uh, uh, audio recording of birds. But uh, again, just gonna open up with a couple of normal housekeeping things. If you wanna chat, if you've got some questions, love to have those questions, put them in a chat, chat to me, uh, because then I will um, ask those questions to, to Norm. Uh, I'll choose the best ones. If it's a dumb question, I'm just gonna drop it. I'm just gonna take the good ones, okay? So if you got a good question, put it in the chat and I'll get to you. Um, other thing is all of these are going to be recorded. They should be up on the website in a few days. Uh, we're, we're, we're working our tail off to make that happen. And um, then the uh, final thing I wanted to let you know is uh, as the result of the cancellation of the festival, our bills are still coming in. We don't have any idea how much we owe because bills are still coming in and refunds are still being made. As we speak, we're refunding over $100,000 of of people's registration fees and opening the mail to see what the bills are. So if you wanna help and, and uh, give us a chance to have a bird festival next year, if you look on this screen uh, down on the bottom left, you can donate by mail with a check to that address, Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival. Or if you have a computer, which you probably have if you're watching this, you can go to that link on the bottom right and uh, donate online. Or if you have one of those fancy new phones, you can uh, put the camera over those QR codes and make a donation just like that. Whatever you can give, if you can give, great. If you can't give, totally understand. It's no big deal. All of these are free. But uh, we appreciate the people who've donated so far to uh, help us uh, bird another day next year in person. A uh, final thing is it's, you know, it's around lunchtime and people are, are looking for a sandwich or a bowl of spaghetti. And if you're on screen, I don't want to watch you eating your bowl of spaghetti. So, so close, close your video, okay? And uh, that way uh, we're not going to be distracted. Okay, so we're about to get started. Let me introduce uh, Norm. He just zipped out and zipped back. I hope he, uh, I hope he got a sandwich or a snack or something. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Norm Pillsbury has seen his whole, whole career as a Cal Poly professor of uh, natural, restore, natural resources management. He's been leading the program to national recognition. In fact, during his career, uh, um, it was awarded $3 million in research. That actually means he got to spend $3 million, however he feels like, I think. And uh, with that money, he authored over 100 publications, mainly related to California's oak woodlands. In fact, he was the first to create the GIS map of 100 million acres of oaks and hardwoods in California. And those oaks, of course, are home to hundreds of bird species. He's an avid daily birder, but has photographed his uh, birds on trips around the world. He's got 25 experience, years of experience in filming, recording, editing, auto, sound for music, and has actually received rewards for that too. So he's applied his knowledge into capturing bird sounds for identification and study. And so he's gonna introduce us to that whole field and I'm really excited about it. So Norm, take it from here. Tell us something we don't know. Wow, Chris, who was that guy you were talking about? <laughs> uh, I'm Norm Pillsbury. I live on the beautiful central coast of California 
And, but I didn't, uh, I wasn't born here. I was born back East in a town of Jamestown, New York. And Jamestown is famous for two people that came out of there. Uh, one was Lucille Ball and the other was Roger Tory Peterson. And my mom was into birding. So it wasn't long before I was birding right along with Roger Tory Peterson at the age of 14, sometimes even driving with him in his car. Now, how does it get any better to get started in birding than that? Well, speaking of getting started, let's get this program going here. I'm going to share my screen and get this thing all set up. Okay, this is the special COVID edition of bird recording. What that means is that um, it's the light version or the limited version. If you want the full version, you've got to come back to Morro Bay next winter to the bird festival, and we hope you do, and you'll get the whole enchilada at that time. But in the meantime, we're gonna go with the light version here, and let's get started. Oh, already we have a news flash. So if you haven't downloaded the app Merlin, uh, go to your app store and do that as soon as possible because there won't be time really to do it later. Or just listen and watch, you'll get the gist of it. That's from the Bird Audio Committee. Okay, here we go. So first we're gonna talk about what we're gonna talk about. Then we're gonna talk about why we record birds, some terms and vocabulary so you know what I'm talking about and then about your objectives and to help you with that and also to help you select the hardware and software to meet your objectives. We'll go into some tips on better recording and then we're gonna work through Merlin's Sound ID software. Are you ready? I am, here we go. So the objectives are to learn about bird audio recording equipment and software because without some knowledge of that, you have a very difficult time figuring out where you're gonna go with this topic and help you determine what level you wanna get into it. What are your objectives? And then we'll demonstrate it. Okay, so reasons to record birds. Well, starting at the top of the list is to identify the ones you'll never see. How many of you have seen a mangrove cuckoo or even heard one? They're pretty seclusive. Or owls in the middle of the night. So there are times when you're just not gonna see the bird, but you might get a recording of it. All right, that would be a very helpful thing to have, especially if you want to provide proof of your identification, if you're gonna post it on eBird. And if you're gonna do that, you wanna make sure you've got it right. So this can be very helpful in that regard. And a different idea here, as you get older, <clears throat> and your hearing start to decline, recording gear can help amplify the sounds. Now here's my last check, and you can see it drops off pretty significantly in the high frequency area. Well, that's where a lot of the small birds talk. They talk up here. And so with this equipment though, I can boost this up and I can level the playing field a bit. So that can be very useful for those of us that are starting to move along in age. And I do want to quickly mention the American Birding Association Code of Ethics about recording. And that is to use restraint to uh, avoid stressing the bird. You, of course, want to get as close as you can to get a good recording or a photograph. But the point is not to stress the bird. And if you start to see that happening, you know, it's best just to kind of back off. Okay. And look at this. Huh. We're recordists. Now, that's a real word. Recordist, uh, that's what we're called. So yeah, oh, there we go, something new. And I wanna talk about recording formats because the compressed formats are fairly low quality, MP3s, MP4s, and we prefer not to have that for uh, get a good uh, sound recording from a bird. We'd like to go with the uncompressed, the .wave or .aif formats because they give you the high quality. Okay, and then in terms of analog versus digital, well, we speak in analog. All the sounds in nature are all in analog. They produce a sound wave like this, this red, red line here. 
but we record it on some electronic device and we record it as digital, which are discrete numbers. So the idea, of course, is then we'll start to sample this. So this first square here shows that you're sampling this like 12 times. And this is one second across here. So if you do that, here's what you get. You get it, it's clipped in the high end, it's clipped in the low end, it's clipped everywhere. That would sound terrible. So the solution is to sample more intensively. So we sample a bunch here, right? And we start to get a curve that mm, a little better, but still pretty rough. Well, if you sample enough, the idea is that you will get a curve with no error in it, and it'll look just like the analog curve, even though it is a digital curve. So this is called the sampling rate. It's the number of times a slice of sound, slice is going this way, is captured per second uh, by a, your computer. And inside your computer or inside your smartphone is something called an analog to digital converter, ADC. So it does it automatically. And we don't have to think about that step, but we do have to think about uh, what kind of equipment we have and how much of a sampling rate we have. We, and the numbers run between about 44 and 192,000. This is, this is per second. Uh, as a minimum, we'd like 48 or 48,000 times. So over here, we got 48,000 times a second. This is one second, we're sampling this 48,000 times. Pretty cool, huh? All right, and then the last term here is bit depth, and that's going the other way. That's the uh, x-axis across here. And so the numbers there are smaller than like 16, 24, 32. So, and the higher the, the higher the bit depth, then that also contributes to a better sound curve. Okay, well, that's a lot of stuff, but the take home message is this. You want high quality, uncompressed, probably you're gonna get dot wave or maybe I, AIF, but one of those two anyhow. And we wanna get at least 48,000 times a second for the, bit, uh, for the sampling rate and at least 24 for the bit depth. Okay, that's gonna give you good quality sound. Okay, another term here is what's called frequency of bird sounds. You know, when we speak, the sound wave we create is not a straight line, it's actually a wave that looks like these curves over here. So if this is one second, then we've got one oscillation or one cycle per second, okay? And, and then up here, we've got 10 of these, right? So we've got 10 per second. So the frequency is, is, is 10. And we measure these oscillations in units called Hertz. Down here, I've spelled it for you. It's not what you think when you fall down, it's, it has to do with electronics. Okay, so H-E-R-T-Z or H-Z. So up here, you've got 10 Hertz, right? 10 Hertz, that's 10 oscillations or 10 samples per second, and that's the frequency of the sound. In music, you might call it the pitch, or you might call it, you know, a high frequency would be a high note or a high pitch. And the lower the, and the lower the frequency, the fewer the oscillations, and the higher the frequency, the more oscillations. All right, well, I think you got that. Uh, I'd like to say I have any questions, but I'm not in my classroom right now. Okay, so let's look at some of the frequency of bird songs. Now, here's four birds I just picked here, and they run between 8,000 and 10,000 Hertz. Okay, that's 10,000 samples per second. If this is one second of time, these things are going up and down. There's 10,000 of them there. These little birds, they really put out the sound, don't they? I don't know if you can hear it, but I'm gonna play one song for you here. Well, I could hear it because I'm right next to my speaker, but if you couldn't hear it, uh, that is the brown creeper. That's this little guy right over here. And so here is his sound signature that you can get on, in some of the software available. And these numbers up here are like 10,000 Hertz, 8,000, 6,000. So you see this guy is right at 8,000, just like he's supposed to be. There's the brown creeper, 8,000. There's his signature, right at 8,000. All right, so that's pretty high. And on the low end, well, we've got the uh, Great horn owl. 
I'm having trouble jumping to the next slide here. Hold on. There we go. Uh, the gray horned owl, and they sing, call, hoot at 300 to 400 hertz. Look at the difference from 8,000 to 300. So we have a huge range in sounds that come from birds. These guys are at the very low end. Gee, if you were in New Guinea, the dwarf cassowaries are as low as 23 hertz. I mean, that's almost zero. So with this huge range, this graph over here is for the great horned owl. And look at, there he is down here, these little short, looks like an owl morse code, this little dashes and long dashes and short dashes. So that is the sound that the great horned owl makes. And these numbers on the side are in thousands. That's 4,000 hertz, 2,000, 1,000, and we're down to 300 right in here. So it's pretty amazing. And this is what he sounds like. Now, if you followed that along, you would, you would, you would match that up with these little Morse code markers of this guy down here. So high frequencies like the warblers and some of the sparrows, uh, they're gonna travel only short distances, high frequencies. The low frequencies travel long distances. In the middle of the night, you can hear an owl a long ways away through the woods. And so there's a little something about bird sounds. Okay, so let's talk about what your objective might be. Um, it'll be helpful when we talk about which hardware and software you use. One idea is just for fun. You just want to kick around, play around with this thing. You're not going to get too serious about it. Um, you know, you don't want to spend much money, maybe you don't want to spend any money, okay? Or you might want to be uh, more serious about this and, and really go for identification, right? Or you maybe even want to post it. Oh, sorry, this has an X on it. This is the limited and light edition. You got to come next winter for the bird festival to get the whole piece there. So let's move on to the next part, which is the low cost. All right, you already have a smartphone. If you have a smartphone, this isn't going to cost you anything. If you don't, then you gotta buy a smartphone. Okay, for software, we're just gonna use what's built in, what comes with your smartphone. But your quality, so-so, hmm, right? Okay, let's, uh, let's go up to uh, identification. For identification, I call that medium cost. You can use a smartphone, but you're gonna want an external microphone. Uh, you, can, you won't use the built-in smartphone uh, phone app, you're gonna, gonna download a, uh, some better software and you're gonna get good quality out of that. And sorry, next slide. Okay, so let's talk about what you're gonna have. You got your smartphone with a built-in mic and with your smartphone, they all come with some software to record your voice or record whatever you wanna record. On the iPhone, it's called voice memos. It's quick, it's easy. Yeah, it's low quality, it's an MP3 or MP4. Hey, if this is all you have, then you can always email a, a audio clip to a friend or somebody to find out what kind of a bird you're listening to. No frills, no date and time, no GPS coordinates, no maps, that's it. Okay, but the idea here is you're just kicking around, having fun, making some recordings of some birds, and it might stimulate you to get a little more interested in recording birds. So let's go to part two here and talk about recording for identification purposes. So this is your objective, right? You wanna identify these birds. Okay, the smartphone we just talked about, you know, it's got the built-in mic, it's semi-directional. You're gonna pick up extraneous sounds, not really a good way to go. A better way to go is a company called Rode. They make very good uh, microphones and they make this little, that it plugs right into your, this little point right here, it plugs right into your iPhone or your smartphone, all right? It also includes a windshield. This is the windshield. And it just fits over the top here, so it covers this up, so it dampens the sound of the wind. I do a lot of movie work, and, <laughs> and we call that a dead cat. I don't know who came up with that. But if your cat died and somebody told you to get a dead cat, you'd be confused at what to get, I think. Okay, now get a little more serious here. You wanna get a shotgun microphone. These are really good, but you pay for what you get, right? $300, the windshield's 50 more. 
but you come through the shock mount and it's directional, really nice directional. You aim that at the bird, you're gonna get the bird, okay? But you also have to have some kind of an adapter to connect to your iPhone, because this has an XLR uh, receptor here. And your iPhone, for example, has a lightning. So you can get a, a nice expensive one, which allows you to plug in and you can monitor what you're doing with your headphones. Or uh, you can get a real cheap one, just this piece right here. Uh, for maybe $20. So anywhere between 20 and 150 for the adapter. So your total, if you went this route, would be like 370 to $500, something like that. Now, if you wanna go one step further, you go to the Tascam. These are audio recorders. You're not using your iPhone. You're recording here, okay? So you're plugging in down here and you're recording here. Now, this is the one I use. I love it, it's rugged, it's never failed. And look here, right here, can you see that? It says WAV, okay, that's the format. Remember I said WAV was a good one, you want that? And right here it says 24, that's the bit depth. I said, that's the minimum you want. So you got 24 right there, that's what you want. And this 192, that's your sampling rate. Look at that, 192 kilohertz. That's 192,000 samples per second that this thing is recording at. Now we're talking about some serious sound, guys. Okay, so that's uh, $350 for that, plus you got you know another $350 for this. So you're talking $700, but you're gonna get good recording. You could go cheaper here. You could get this little Marantz down here. It's only 48,000 samples per second compared to 192. And it's only 16 bit, but it's $100 cheaper. Okay, so, so recording can be done on your smartphone or it could be done on a standalone recorder, all right? And the prices are, are what I showed. For headphones, uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on headphones. If you spend $100, you'll get a good enough headphone to do what you need to do. There, I said I wasn't gonna spend much time, let's go. Okay, now for software, uh, since you're after identification, then Sound ID which is part of the Merlin app is the way to go. A lot of good features, excellent quality with external mic for sound, retains the date, the time, the GPS, good labeling system, description of the bird, similar sounds that you can compare it to, and range maps, and best of all, it's free. Free, imagine that. Okay, there's others, one called Song Sleuth that's no longer supported, so I won't cover that. Now, if you want to edit your uh, audio files so that they can be sent to people or cleaned up and so forth, uh, there's a couple of suggestions here. One is called Audacity. It's open source. It's, you can download it from the web and it's free. Now, I don't, and I've never used Audacity to be honest with you, but I just wanna say that for those people that I know that have, they feel like it does what it, they need to do. So, you know, if you're starting out, definitely go the, the, the free route, right? Try it out, see how you like it, get used to it. Uh, maybe it's good enough. And if you want to advance further, you go to one of the Adobe Suite items, which is called Addition. It's a sound um, software, but it has a subscription of $20 a month. So you're going to be a little more serious if you're going to go that route. Okay, so that's recording for the purpose of identification. Now, I suspect that a good number of you are just going to want to do it for fun and play around, and there you go. But for those of you that want to be a little more serious and try to really identify the birds, um, you probably want to go what I call the medium cost uh, direction. So you're going to download the Merlin software, you're going to get an external microphone, you're going to have headphones, etc. Okay, so that gives you some idea, and if you really want to get fancy, you got to come back and in the winter and, and talk about fancy. But the, most people are gonna probably be right here. Okay, any questions? No, I can't ask that. All right, next. Let's work, talk, talk about working with Sound ID. That's the option that you have in the Merlin app. It's simple to use, it's free, and you can export the sound, uh, sound file for working with other software very easily, very nice. It's of all the apps that purport to 
identify birds, this is the best for accuracy. There are older ones, there's one called Song Sleuth, one called Bird Song ID, they are not near as accurate. Uh, Cornell has really done a lot of good work on this. They don't uh, even include a bird unless they have at least 100 samples of their song scattered throughout the range of the bird. Um, so that's very helpful. They have like over 500 birds listed in the, uh, in the sound app itself. So most likely what you're looking for, you can find. They're adding more all the time. They're really doing a bang up job on the sound stuff. And another nice feature, and I'll demonstrate this one, it's easy to compare with other bird sounds for verification. So very nice. And uh, oh gosh, you get nice maps, you get GPS coordinates, all that. So I would say that this is an excellent additional tool for helping identify birds. It has surprised me many times with uh, hearing, uh, with it picking up a bird that I haven't heard or I haven't seen and that I didn't even think was maybe in this area, a place I've birded many times and never seen it. So now I start looking, I go look and I look and I find this bird. So it was there. So it surprised me, very nice. On the negative side, it's not 100% accurate. And if it picks up a rare bird, you'd better see it singing or photograph it or send the audio file to someone for verification. There's a nice uh, website called xenoconto.org, which uh, you can upload any, audio file of a bird and people will help you figure out what it is. Um, it, this app has also surprised me many times that it can't ID a loudly calling common bird. What gives, man? I was standing under a tree the other day, a nettles woodpecker was blasting away. And I looked down and it didn't pick it up. And I kept waiting and waiting it. I don't think it ever did pick it up. Sometimes I notice it does, but oftentimes it doesn't. Now, I don't know, maybe I was too close to it. And then I'd like to make a little note here about um, there can be a tendency to over rely on this to identify birds. Just remember, this is a secondary tool. It's not the primary source. Your primary source is your ears and your eyes and your brain figuring this thing out. So if somebody says, hey, look, there goes bird X, Y, Z, and you look up and you see two or three birds flying off in the, in the horizon and they look like silhouettes to you, are you going to write that down as one of your life birds? Well, I hope not. Um, so, you know, what if he sees a bird in a tree and he goes, look, there's ABC bird. And you got your binoculars, you spot it, you look at the marks for the bird and you go, yeah, I get it. Okay, now you got it, right? That's, that's a secondary, the person that told you about it, going to primary, you, positively identifying it with field marks. So the Sound ID app is, is sort of the same way. It's a secondary. It's, the, it's Merlin saying, that's an ABC bird that you just saw. Now you need to make sure that it's, it's right because it's not 100% accurate. So, so a little bit of uh, caution here when you're using this and being careful how you count your birds just based on the app. And lastly, I'll tell you that this thing eats batteries for lunch. Uh, if you're going to use it very much, you're going to want an extra battery pack to go along with it, and that'll help you a lot. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the problems you're going to have because the beginner goes out and gets all these audio files. It comes back, and, and they're junk. They just, you can't, you know. So if you've got traffic nearby, you, you need to find another place to, to, to record. Airplanes are terrible. From the far right horizon to the far left horizon, it'll ruin your recording as this plane, even a small plane, is passing overhead. Water is very, very tough on it. For some reason, it just uh, there's lots of frequencies that come out of water, which means that <laughs> your, your whole range of frequencies are going to be interfered with. Breathing, closed movement, walking, shifting weight, how you hold the mic. If you're fumbling around with the mic, you're going to pick up your fumbling around, not the bird. Um, always use a windscreen if you can. Ah, take quiet people with you. Everybody likes to talk. We're social, right? And, um, but you're not going to get good recordings if people are talking over it. Extra batteries. Other birds can interfere with it. You know, you get a, a California thrasher sounding off and you're not gonna get much of a recording around him. Uh, rain, even light rain, and HVAC systems, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems on top of roofs, 
if you're next to a building that's got one of these and this thing starts up in the middle of you trying to record a bird, it's going to be kind of tough for you to, to get much out of it. Dogs, lawnmowers. So in the movie making business, we have something called fix it and post. What that means is, okay, we got a bad recording. So we'll take it into your office and we'll fire up one of these software packages and we'll get rid of all the problems. Well, that's not going to happen. If you've got a good recording, you can make it a little bit better. But if you've got a bad recording, you're never going to make it good. So while you might be able to enhance it some, you're never probably going to get what you really want. So while you're there in the field, wait it out. Even if you've got people that are you know, anxious to go, wait it out and try to get it the best recording you can. Because just remember, G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. If you've got a bad recording that you've made, it's still gonna be bad when you're back in your office trying to work with it. Okay, so now we're gonna work with sound ID. And so get your smartphones out while I switch gears here. Okay, so on your sound, uh, on your sound ID, so on your on your smartphone, let's start there. Here's my smart, smartphone. Uh, what we're gonna do is start this up. There we go. So what we're gonna do is uh, find our Merlin app. We're gonna launch it. And then of, this, of these options, you're gonna pick sound ID. Okay, and when you do, you get three more options. You're going to pick the microphone because that's what we want to do. We want to record. Now I'm going to pause right here for a second because I know you just got your smartphone out and I'm going to give you a chance to catch up with me. So I'm going to give you about 10 seconds here. Should be good enough. Well, I just got the note that I can only take three seconds. So now we're going to go. Here we go. So as soon as you press that, you're now recording sound. So it's listening for whatever it can find. Let's see what this one finds. Wow, look at that. Bam, bam, there's your Morse code from the hooting owl. And it says it's a great horned owl, just like that. Didn't waste take any time to find that one. Now, that's what it says. But if you don't know your owl sounds, you might go, well, I don't know. Is it really that or not? Let me listen to that again. Well, this has got a great feature. First, you save it down here. Then you, then you click on here, and, and then you tap Greyhorn Dow and hit play, and it'll, it's really cool. It jumps to the spot where the sound was recorded. If this is two minutes long, it goes zing right to the spot where it's recorded. You don't have to listen to all two minutes, right? Okay, okay so you can do that as much as you want, but it's got another great feature down here embedded into your app is another great horned owl song, right? So you can play that and compare it to your song. Well, that guy's got a bit of an accent, but that's your great horned owl, right? So you you got that nailed. So you can go back and forth between these two, but in our case, we don't have to worry about a new recording. We know we've got the bird. So click on, this is my bird. Up comes a map look where you're located. If that's correct, you can hit next. If it's not, you go to the blue bar here, press that, you can enter a new location. Because if you go home to do this, you're gonna have your home location. So we're not gonna do that because we're in the right spot. So we, press, we move on to the next slide. And now we confirm our sighting. And if it's uh, confirmed, then click save. It saves it to your iPhone. And now you've got it. Okay, at this point, you can ID another bird, or in my in this example, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. We're gonna go back one screen um, because it's another option there that's very fun, and that's this one right here. It's called the export option. So we're gonna export this sound because if you're like me and I got a rare bird, I want to make sure I've got this sound in two places. So I'm gonna email it to myself, and. If I'm in the field and have a signal, I can email it. If I'm home, when I do this, I'll airdrop it. But don't use text messages. This is compressed file. Mail and airdrop are not compressed. 
So you'll get the best quality sound if you use one of those two, but don't use text messages. All right, so it takes you right to your email. You type in who you're gonna send it to. In my case, I send it to myself, but you could send it to anybody you like to help you with this. Identify it and, and it should be there. Mm, but maybe you wanna be sure about that. So let's uh, take a quick look in our mail. And there it is, so I'm good. Okay, one last thing I wanna point out and that's back on the identification page and that's up here, there's a back button. If you click select that, it will give you a list of all the sound recordings you've made um, in Sound ID. And so if you know which one's yours, you can always play this for somebody else and they'll uh, have a chance to listen to it and, and consider it. Okay. I have wrapped this up and I'm, I uh, just wanna say one last thing here. Let's see, stop sharing, there we go. The one last thing I wanna say is that these, re these uh, presentations are being recorded. So even though that was maybe a little on the fast side and you probably couldn't keep up very well, you can always go back and slow it down with a recording and you can follow through step-by-step step and you'll have it nailed. So if you've never used Sound ID, folks, I hope this helped a little. Okay, Chris, back to you. Oh my stars! I never knew any of that stuff. I, I just I just got a whole education, and I can't wait to try it out. Boy, that uh, being able to record and learn from the Merlin Sound app—that's just really great. Um, so I'm gonna see if anybody's got questions. Uh, go ahead and throw them into the chat right now. Uh, uh, Maria Lynn said, "Awesome, thank you, Dr. Pillsbury." Uh, so that's that's a, a little thumbs up for you. But if you've got a question, now is a good time to ask the questions and I will ask them to everybody else. I'm gonna pause for just a second. So, uh, you know, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, you got, you, you went birding with uh, Roger Torrey Peterson. You know, that's kind of a bragging point, isn't it? Man, that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, we've got some, uh, we've got some questions right here. Uh, thank you, Norman. I didn't know about Song Sleuth. I just deleted that one and have Merlin and know how to use it because of your presentation. Uh, some, and that was uh, Tim, Tina England Cal. And then John says, quick feature comparison of Merlin versus BirdNet. Any, any comments on that? Um, I don't. I haven't downloaded the most recent uh, version of BirdNet. I think it's okay. Uh, I don't think it has near the database, from what I understand, that uh, Cornell's uh, does. Um, but you know what? It's not a bad starter one. So, you know, if it works, I uh, use it. And if you get good at it and want to advance, I would definitely go to Sound ID. Good. Someone, uh, someone asked, uh, they said, I have a Zoom recorder. Should I get a windshield for the mics? Well, windshields are great. Um, let me just say a bit more about the windshield. They will help you, especially in a condition of low wind. Even low wind will cause you troubles and interference with your recording. Uh, if you get a high wind, it's not gonna, <laughs> nothing's gonna help, right? Uh, stand in, a, in an alleyway and, and, and try to get the bird from there, I guess. Um, so whenever you can and are able to find a windshield, I would definitely recommend it because a lot of times you're out there and it will make a difference. If the wind's really blowing hard, chances are you're not out there anyway. Good. Uh, Karen McKinley, one of your students says, great intro professor, good to see you again. Uh, Maria Lynn says, how far away can you be and still pick up a good enough recording, roughly? Obviously it's gonna depend on the, the high or the low of the bird because I just learned that the low frequencies travel farther and the high frequencies are short. Uh, but generally, roughly speaking, how far away do you have to be? Well, that's a great question. Um, I am always surprised by Sound ID at how far away it can pick up a bird. I mentioned earlier, it, per it picks up birds I'm not seeing. And then I have to go hunt around to find them. So you're finding birds uh, quite a ways away. I would say two or 300 feet sometimes, um, more reliably, probably within 100 feet. Um, yesterday I was outside and some white-throated Swiss flew over. I didn't even see them. Uh, but it picked it up. And I went, what? I don't think so. And I started looking and I found them, three of them up there. Wow. They were probably up two or 300 feet. I could hardly see them with my binoculars. So wow. 
it, it is surprising, but I wouldn't guarantee that every species will give you that kind of quality. Um, but you can test, test it out, you know, take it outside and, and try to find a bird and then record it and see how far away you can get. Sweet. Uh, Judy McKinley just uh, did a quick look and found the Tascam DR40 and lower numbers than the 100 you suggested. Is that a lower quality? Uh, hi, Karen. It's good to hear from you. Um, you see, I would say that the best thing to do is look at the specs. Uh, they'll give you that. If it's not at least 24 bit, and if it's not uh, 48,000 uh, K or 48,000 samples per second, I would probably not get it if you want to really get a good quality sound. Okay, uh, Corey wants to know if there's an adjustment to my phone mic or device to get an ID. My Merlin sound never seems, never can seem to get an ID. Is there some adjustment in the phone? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know of any adjustments to the phone, but I also don't know why you're not getting this to work. Um, bring it by and I'll have a look at it. Do you know Corey? <laughs> okay. Uh, Cindy wants to know if a brown creeper can hear an owl and vice versa based on their sound frequency abilities to spit it out. Does that uh, correlate to their ability to get it in? I, lo I love that question. Uh, the answer is yes. The short answer is yes. The birds hear at a lot of frequencies. By the way, what do people hear at? Well, people hear at about 20 to 20,000, 20 to 20,000. So even that little New Guinea um, bird at 23, we we could hear. Now that's what we're born with. But as we grow, that curve starts to go down. I showed you my curve, right? Right. So I'm probably down around 15,000, maybe 12,000. I don't really know the exact number um, hertz, which means that I'm not going to hear without some help uh, a lot of these birds. Um, but the birds can hear other birds. Uh, they have to for survival. Uh, if, right. if somebody's coming in after them, they better know who's coming in after them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of people like Maria Lynn says, wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, do you need to set your location before picking up bird sounds? When I went in vacation, when I went in, vacation had trouble getting IDs. I don't know. Uh, probably that's... Uh, Anyway, uh, so do you have to set up your location first? No, I, I don't. Wherever I go, it gives me the location automatically. Now, maybe maybe when I got it, I forget. Maybe when I got it, there was some kind of a auto setup or something. I'll have to take a look at that again. Okay. Uh, we're open for a couple more uh, questions. We got a couple more minutes. Uh, but Susan wants to know, what happens if a bunch of different birds start singing at the same time? How does that work in Merlin? Is it going to ID more than one bird? It will. Where I showed you it had uh, the great horned owl listed, it'll keep listing them right down that line. So you can get five or 10 birds there. Um, if, if they're at different frequencies, remember the brown creeper was way high and the owls were way low, that won't interfere. The only interference you get is if they're about the same frequency and then you then sound ID has to wait until one of them is quiet and the other is talking and, and they'll pick it up. Um, so it's amazing. And then, as I said, you just tap the bird and it takes you right to the sound. You can listen to it over and over again. You can let other people listen to it. You can compare it with uh, like birds. It's a very cool app. That's that's crazy. I just learned a lot. Uh, our, our last one is more of a comment than a question. Oh, maybe I have one more question. Uh, but Debbie says Dr. P was a great teacher when she was an NRM student in the 70s. And it's so nice to learn about Merlin all these years later. So uh, another another pat on the back there. Uh, does uh, let's see. I got uh, I think two questions and then we're going to quit. So Tina wants to know if it's an iPhone. Oh, uh, anyway, she's uh, she's writing to everybody. How about how how to fix your phone uh, in the settings? Okay, John wants to know: Does Merlin Sound ID require an internet connection to work, or does it use a software uh, to do the app? It does not require an internet connection. However, uh, you saw the map that came up on the example I gave. To have that map identify exactly where you are at the time you do it, you would need a connection of some sort. But it's not that hard to go back and then press the long blue line there and then refine it on the map and locate it that way. But it does okay. not require internet. There, there are, are other questions about uh the minimum phone version of, uh, of iPhone to use. And we're going to leave that. Uh, we're just going to say, uh, you know, get the 
the the latest version you can afford and uh and and there we go so as we close this out norm i just want uh, dr pillsbury i just wanted to say um you know you you've been concerned like uh, does anybody even care about this should we have this sort of event in the festival it seems like we don't get very good attendance uh we've got a hundred and uh, like 130 people here today and uh, a lot of them showing extreme interest to stay through the whole thing. Very few people dropped out in the process. And I think you just educated a whole pile of folks. And you know what? Next year, I think they're going to all be coming to your event because it really is cool. So thank you for your willingness to share your expertise. I can't, I, you know, I want to go out birding with you just so I can say I've been birding with someone who's been birding with Tori, um, you know. Uh, that, that'd be a cool thing. So let me get my, uh, as, as, we, as we close this down, uh, Bob is going to put up the uh, final slide and uh, the final slide will have some uh, notes on uh, who's coming up next. And the next uh, show is all about owl boxes. And that's with Tom and Peggy. And looking forward to that. Again, we're going to auction. So get your checkbook out and get ready. I don't know how exactly we're going to do that, but we'll figure it out. Okay. So if you're ready to auction for an owl box because you've got a friend with a ranch or you've got a pile of gophers in your backyard, it's time for you to have an owl box. Uh, so that's the next thing up. After that, we've got a double header with Benjamin Jacob Swartz. Uh, it's both on feathers and on hummingbirds. So looking forward to those two things. And then the final one tonight will be all about how in the world are we going to run bird festivals in this uh, brave new world of ours, uh, our, our own uh, uh, power behind the throne here. Bob Ravel has uh, created a new way to run a bird festival called Bubble Link, and we're going to talk about that. If you know anybody that runs bird festivals, have them get on at that six o'clock hour. That's really critical. Uh, again, you've seen that last slide, and that includes places to donate. If you can donate, appreciate it. If you can't, we understand all these things are free, and we're going to be um, posting them online. But at this time, we're going to say goodbye. We're going to uh, close down this show, and then we're going to start the next one in a few minutes at the top of the hour. So come on back in for Owl Boxes. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh,